that. But uh, our last speaker uh, is going to be Professor uh, Andy Gledo from Melbourne University, who was, uh, as we heard last night, a student on the collection mission for Murchison Meteorite in the day after the, uh, the arrival of the Murchison Meteorite. Thank you. I'm the, the light relief, I think, at the end of <laughs> a pretty solid afternoon. Um, I, I have enjoyed immensely all of the talks from my distinguished uh, research colleagues. I, I have been a research scientist for the last 50 years, and that really all started from uh, straight after uh, 1969. Um, but I'm not really going to talk about what I've done over my career. I'll make a little bit of a mention of things that I did at the beginning. But uh, 50 years ago, 1969, was an incredibly exciting time for those of us in the geological sciences, and there are a number of us here who were around. It's, it was a time when the theory of plate tectonics was emerging as the solution to 200 years of accumulation of geological observations, which we had no idea. Uh, how they all fitted together. There were things in paleontology, there were things in geophysics, there were things in uh, the study of rocks, petrology as we call it, uh, all of which were in their own sort of little realms and we never really had any way of putting them all together. There was, there was a thing called geosynclinal theory, which I remember you know, Bill Birch and I were students together, we had this drilled into us. It was, I think in the history of science there's never been a greater a more spectacular failure of a theory to actually explain anything. It was just a way of marshalling observations. But in 19, but it, it, from between 1963 and about 1967, radical new interpretations of the way planet Earth worked uh, were figured out and the, uh, the whole theory of plate tectonics, which Craig uh, talked about before, that the Earth's surface is covered by a series of relatively rigid uh, segments which are moving relative to each other and all of the major uh, geological processes which produce the great features of Earth, the, the ocean basins, the mountain ranges and so on, uh, the area, the belts of volcanic activity, they are all consequences of this internal dynamics of planet Earth. The basic principles were all figured out in the early 60s. I was a student of geology, an undergraduate student from 1967 to 1969. Plate tectonics was never mentioned <laughs> in our entire uh, very classical geological training. Didn't impinge at all. Its predecessor, the idea of continental drift, that continental, uh, continental masses could move across the earth, was only mentioned once or twice and then only to disparage it. Uh, so this was a very interesting time, but by about 1969, we had sufficient uh, knowledge to actually start reading the geological literature, and then we were exposed to this amazing uh, thing that was happening. It is one of the greatest scientific revolutions that has ever happened in the history of science. And this excitement really started to impinge on us, on us as students, although our lecturers ignored it completely, um, at that time, and in, there was a particular paper published by John Dewey, who is still alive today. Um, in 1969, he started putting all this together in terms of an explanation of how the, the continents worked. Because plate tectonics was really uh, derived from an understanding of the behaviour of the ocean basins, which are vastly simpler than, the, than the, what we see in the continents. So all of this started to come together then, and it was a time of amazing excitement. But of course it wasn't the only thing happening in 1969. Right throughout the 60s, I could scarcely sleep at night in, in my sense of excitement and anticipation of, of the moon landings uh, before the end of that decade. And of course it happened twice in 1969. Um, so we had plate tectonics going on, we had the, the first new perspectives of what was going on on planet Earth as one planet amongst many by getting an extraterrestrial perspective, first from uh, the study of the, the rocks from the Moon, but almost simultaneously from Murchison, which gave us a, a deep insights, as we've heard through this afternoon's talks. So all of this was going on, and then, of course, 
Uh, on the day that, uh, uh, well, we'll come to that in a second, but of course we've heard all about Murchison and this uh, remarkable meteorite that, was, uh, that fell on the 28th of September in 1969. This is a, this is a map, an old paper map, uh, with locations of many, many of the uh, samples that were found in the early collections around this area, and they define a very a broad swath, a broad band coming from the, the southeast to the northwest across Murchison, right over the town. And uh, of course, with, within this area, um, there were people were recognizing that these rather these very black rocks that were being picked up were of, of great importance. Even on the first day, stories were starting to get out. And a quick phone around occurred between the third year students in our third year geology class, geology part three, as we used to call it. And uh, many of us, like something around 30 people, and including even a couple of second year students came along. And we were uh, under the uh, sort of guidance of uh, Dr. Roger LeMate, who was our acting head of department at the time, um, and we were designated to come around and, and look through many sort of open, flat areas of your wonderful town and its environs. And um, we, were, we, kept, we all drove up in our own cars, carpooling to come, and a, and a number of very important uh, samples were some collected by by locals, by, located by Mr. Gillam here. These two were samples that are in the Museum Victoria collection, collected by Rob Duncan, in, uh, who is a part two student, another one by Tony Mason, one of our colleagues in that third year class. So a number of specimens were collected that day. But as we, uh, as we began the day, we drove up in the morning, I was delegated to uh, go and uh, walk with a number of others, walk one of the fairways at the golf course. That was a very promising place. It had been mown reasonably recently and a good place to see black rocks lying around on the surface. Um, but then the word got out that uh, at the Brisbane's dairy, a piece of meteorite had hit the, uh, hit the uh, uh, a railing around a large con circular concrete pan where the, where the cows uh, congregated after being milked and then once they'd all finished and they were led back out into the paddocks. Two of us were t assigned, told, that we should go and uh, search for fragments of a meteorite in this particular area. But there were other, I'll come to that again in a second, that's really the point of the story, but there were a number of contemporary records which have come to light and are in the, the Museum of Victoria uh, collection. There's a wonderful painting of, uh, uh, by uh, Walter Anshin of uh, Croydon, who was driving home from church that morning. And at 1045, he, he said, it may just be the watches weren't quite as accurate at that time, but this was further down the trail. So it is, in fact, quite probable that that time was accurate. He got home and did a watercolour sketch of the actual plume in the sky that he saw, the actual meteor trail that he saw in the sky going there, and gave a, a, quite a full description. The object was very bright, possibly with a touch of yellow. He was trying to get it all down. And he said that when it, uh, it seemed to be breaking up towards the end, and of course that is looking almost exactly towards Murchison. This section of Bayswater Road is almost uh, north-south at that point, and it is heading slightly to the west of that line, which is obvious, as we know. That is basically the direction of Murchison. Um, there were a number of other things that went on at that time, other sort of records. There was a, a well-known artist, um, not with us anymore, Eric Thake, who has a number of sketches and drawings uh, in the, uh, the National Gallery of Victoria. And this is a, a sketch that uh, he produced. He used to amuse himself by doing very rapid sketches of people on TV. You only have a few seconds, usually, to grab that. And one of these, he, there were three people that appeared uh, on TV that night. I think it was on uh, This Day Tonight or something like that on the ABC. And here we have Professor Lovering Murchison Meteorite, a sketch of Professor John Lovering, who was our head of department, uh, recently arrived at the University of Melbourne Geology Department. 
here's a Mr. Wilson talking about China, and here's a Woodstock Art Festival, a suitably Woodstock-looking character talking about presumably Woodstock that year. But there was also another wonderful record, which is a, a police statement. Here is a carbon copy, the old sort of carbon copy of a police statement taken at the Shepparton Police Station by uh, Constable Hutchins, who wrote down in this very sort of uh, uh, formal way the, the comments that he made, because he had had a piece of a black Coke-like substance had been handed to me by Mr Deathridge of the Shepparton News, uh, who had brought this sample, which had been collected about, uh, found around 4pm by Mr Arnold Brisbane, the father of Bruce Brisbane and uh, father-in-law of, of Beth Brisbane here, uh, who, whose dairy was, was hit by this. this. He found this on this concrete pan outside the dairy and wondered what it was. But there, was, there were more pieces of this, and we will see what happened to that. I love the, uh, the, the supervisor here and sort of, OK, forensic science, and this was sent off to forensic science. <laughs> anyway, this is what happened at the dairy. I, don't, I mean, it, I just wish we had cameras like we all carry around in our pockets today. We didn't. Uh, there's virtually no photographs that we took that day eh, amongst the whole 30 of us. Uh, I had a camera, I didn't think to take it. But here is the, here is the steel railing uh, around the edge of the concrete pan down here, and that is the mark made, a little dent in fact, where the, a piece of the meteorite hit the railing and shattered all across the concrete pan. And of course the, the, the cattle uh, were, the cows were coming out after, here's a, a lovely photo of some Murchison cows taken by my wife on a run this morning, uh, just outside town, uh, and after they have been milked, they came out onto this concrete pan and they do what cattle do uh, uh, in such occasions, almost continually, being <laughs> ruminants, and they, um, uh, this uh, cat, this was a lovely mixture now of small shattered pieces of meteorite, only, you know, mostly less than a centimetre across, uh, distributed right across this in amongst all the, the, the cow manure. And uh, of course Mr Brisbane then, uh, as was his habit, would, would hose down the pan ready for the next milking. And all of this ended up in a kind of a cesspit beside the region, where two of us, me and another guy, and I can't even remember who he was now, uh, we were so sort of focused on this, but we were assigned the job of searching through this for more fragments of the meteorite. Now, of course, you'll remember that the, one of the main points that makes Murchison so important is all of these complex organic compounds. Now, Murchison wasn't the first carbonaceous chondrite in which these organic compounds had been found. There were indications of complex organic materials in other uh, carbonaceous chondrite samples prior to that, but there'd been a huge argument raging uh, in, the, in the literature about whether these were intrinsic to the meteorite or whether they were just biological contamination. The importance of Murchison, of course, was it, it was picked up immediately, whereas the other samples that had been analysed had been lying around on the surface of the earth for an unknown period of time. Well, here is me as a third year student, beardless, lots of hair, <laughs> uh, we had a lot more in the next few years, and we were assigned to literally go through this, but uh, Mr Brisbane kindly provided us both with pairs of gumboots, because <laughs> it wasn't very deep, this sort of deep, and we, so we could stand up in this, basically a slurry of cow manure, very wet and slimy. <laughs> <laughs> and we just had to roll up our sleeves and spend the day sieving through. I can still remember the feel of this. You know? <laughs> sieving through, feeling for lumps. <laughs> and we found a surprising lot of this stuff, found lots of little bits. And when we washed these, uh, which we did very thoroughly afterwards, but the, um, you could still smell the, the outgassing of the, the aromatic organic compounds. My memory is with mineral turpentine. Most people say methylated spirits, but to me the smell, the dominant smell, at least after being in cow manure and then washed, was mineral turpentine. 
Um, but there, no doubt at all, this was an extraordinarily interesting material. And of course, um, old Professor Lovering, the, the new prof at Melbourne, he had only arrived at Melbourne in the middle of uh, 1969. He had been at the ANU, uh, the Research School of Earth Sciences, where, where Trevor is, uh, prior to that for many years, and was had been a noted uh, meteorite specialist uh, in that earlier phase. He was a geochemist and had done many different things. So that's me and that's John. This was actually an early uh, 1970 and a TV uh, program on the ABC, and that's me about that time, I think at a friend's wedding or something. Um, and John was one of the four Australian scientists who we actually saw a photograph that Trev showed at the end of his talk. Uh, who were principal investigators on the moon rock analysis program. They were, had been successful in having projects awarded, funding awarded to them and a collection of, uh, of samples of the moon rocks. But John Lovering told me, reminded me just, just three weeks ago that in fact the day he arrived back, they had to go to Houston to collect the samples and come back with them, literally hand carried them back to Australia. And then there was that event at the uh, Academy of Science in Canberra and some, uh, some function of the US Embassy as well that uh, John tells me, and I'm not, we're, Trevor and I were arguing about the date before because the 21st of September doesn't fit with John's recollection of the story. He had to, he arrived back in Australia on the 28th of September, the day that Murchison fell, and uh, was not able to come up the next day with this whole group from the university department because he had to go to Canberra for this function. Um, but of course, he did come back with, with moon rocks and, um, and of course he, came, he did come up to Murchison uh, soon after and in fact I believe he stayed with uh, one of the families here. So, but this began an association of me. I mean, in those days, this was the days of the God Professor. There was the Professor, there was other academic staff who essentially served the interest, interests of the Professor, and then there were students, and that was something else. And you, uh, but John changed so many things. He began a major emphasis on research activities. He revitalised the department, and that was part of, for me, the excitement of that time, that this department went from basically being a, a very structured, very disciplined, very boring 19th century style geology, very descriptive. We learned some wonderful skills, but all of the, the tremendous things, the modern science that was happening was largely overlooked until John came. And it began a lifelong association between John and myself. I was, I confess that I have never actually studied Murchison uh, after that day. I'm not sure if I really never wanted to see it again after that <laughs> particular day, but I was in the laboratory. I was working in the lab where other people were indeed uh, studying, studying Murchison. But I did get involved for the first five years of my, my professional career. I did get in, in, involved uh, working for about three months each year for the next five years out of my PhD, which is on a different subject, um, with John. Uh, studying the various moon rocks, and these are some thin section photographs of under polarised light that gives you these lovely colour displays um, of some of the samples that uh, John had and that we worked on. And in fact, I, some of my earliest papers, uh, scientific papers, were on uh, the studies we were doing. So there's me there, there's Roger Lemaitre who was our act acting head on that weekend when the meteorite fell, and of course John here. But the first... The, the first paper that um, actually grew out of my work on the moon rocks was, uh, I, I spent a great deal of time, one of the new instruments that John got into the geology department was a scanning electron microscope with an energy dispersive X-ray analyzer, which meant that you could, wherever the electron beam was, you could analyze the characteristic X-rays given off by a tiny little volume about three micrometres across under the electron beam and see what it was made of. And this was revolutionary to observe these rocks. And I remember studying some of these lunar samples that were only the size of a pea. You know, we'd make a polished surface on it and I would spend days driving backwards and forwards across this thing under the scanning electron microscope at enormous magnification and looking for interesting things and just hitting them with the electron beam and seeing what they were made of. 
And we, we found all sorts of things that uh, we hadn't seen before. There were three new minerals discovered which had never been found on Earth. Um, and they were found there because we were looking at those rocks in a way, and the same was true of the meteorites, in ways that we had never studied ordinary Earth rocks before. So it actually turns out that those three new minerals found on the Moon without were unknown on Earth, we found all of them now on, on the Earth. Um, and one of these was a mineral called Tranquilityite, which is uh, these bright white um, minerals up there. It's, a, it's an iron, zirconium, titanium silicate. It was rather exotic, only present as relatively small, very nice foxy red-brown crystals. Um, you don't get colour in the transmission, in the uh, scanning electron microscope images. But here is a a crystal of a pyroxene, it's got a couple of little crystals of potassium feldspar, which in itself is interesting in a basalt lava, which is what this rock was, a very coarse grained basalt lava. And, but inside that, if we looked at it under a particular kind of observation, the backscattered electron uh, observation, which is very sensitive to, uh, it gives a very bright reflection where you have heavy elements present. And in this, one night, as I was scanning backwards and forwards across this, I found one little crystal here. It's about 4 micrometres by about 15 micrometres across. That's a 10 micrometre scale. Remember, Trevor was saying that a, a human hair is about 100 micrometres across. This is unbelievably small. And it turned out to be a mineral which is a phosphate of the rare earths, a mineral we call monazite, a well-known mineral on Earth, very rich in these... Uh, these uh, uh, rare earth elements. That to this day is the only crystal of monazite that has ever been found in a rock from the moon, uh, to my knowledge anyway. And it, it, we wrote a paper about it. You know, John wrote the paper and uh, so there's this monazite crystal. Not an uncommon mineral on earth at all, but here we are, lunar monazite and there's John Lovering and I together uh, for the first time. These events, for me, that that last six months of 1969, of which Murchison, the fall of the Murchison meteorite was a critical part, were absolutely um, motivating for me in a way that nothing had been in my previous undergraduate career. And I went on then to, to do my honours year the next year, and Bill Birch and I, Bill, the emeritus curator of rocks, minerals and meteorites at the museum, Dermot's uh, predecessor in that role, um, we had a fantastic year mapping the geology of an area around, from uh, around Marysville up to about Eildon. And, um, but at the end of that year, John Lovering uh, became my PhD supervisor and I got much more involved in all of this work. And that has led to a, an, an extraordinary uh, lifetime in science. I think any of my scientific colleagues would say the same thing. We have just been extraordinarily fortunate in the opportunities we've had. Uh, to be able to do things that uh, go places that uh, most people don't get a chance to do. I've worked on every continent on Earth, including the cold one uh, down in Antarctica, a lot of work in Africa. and I'm currently leading a very large research project dating the Aboriginal rock art up in the Kimberley. Here I am with Augie and Ango up uh, near Columbaroo in the North Kimberley uh, just last year. So it has been a, a, an amazing time and it all started in that if it wasn't for those events, I'm not saying Murchison was the only driver for this, but it was just this one, one after the other, all of these incredibly exciting things happened. And of course it led to a, a lifelong association with John Lovering. This is uh, three or four weeks ago, 24th of August, and here's John, nearly 90. He'll be 90 early next year. And uh, we have an association that goes back to 1969. Here's a photograph of us when we were PhD students. Um, here's John here, here's Roger LeMate who was his deputy, and there's me over here. I mean, so the hair was getting more and more abundant around that time, in the early 70s. Here's Bill Birch, also with a fine head of dark hair. <laughs> uh, but this was, this really is the end of the story. It was a, it was a time which I have never experienced such a period of just bang, 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 one extraordinarily exciting thing after another. 
And essentially, it launched me on a career, and that, that sense of excitement has never stopped. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And yeah, um, we have a question. The uh, prevention of tertiary art. Yes. Where did you eventually find it? It was found only two or three years ago in Western Australia. In a, in, I don't think, I, I think it's been found in several other places since. I think it's probably not very rare, but it's always very small grains and they're just sort of sitting in between the major crystal grains and the sort of thing that if you're just doing a normal study, you would never see. But if you want to take a tiny little piece and spend you know, hours and days driving around it with a scanning electron microscope looking at literally every little piece in there, you will find it. I suspect it's actually not that rare. And, uh, uh, the first station rock art. Yes. Do you have any, any idea of all the that you have we, have we have dates. We have uh, several hundred dates now by I've got a team of 20 researchers around the country, uh, top specialists in various different fields. We basically ha have funding to hit this with everything we've got and to really try and work it out. So it's an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. Uh, but those of us, you know, like Trevor and myself, have been involved in geochronology for years. There's, there's a lot of... Uh, the techniques we have, the, the, the technologies we have, are so powerful compared to what we used to have that... Uh, there are things we can do now that we couldn't even dream about before. So we're trying to date mineral accretions that grow on the rock surfaces. We're using uh, accelerator mass spectrometry, the sort of probably the biggest mass spectrometers ever, um, even dwarf the shrimp, to analyse tiny amounts of radiocarbon in little particles of charcoal in mud wasp nests that, that can bracket the age of the thing. The mud wasp put mud very kindly all over the rock surfaces. Sometimes these are painted over and then new ones, new nests, are made on top of the paint. So if we can date under and over, we can, we can bracket the age of the art. We have dates going back now to around 20,000 years. We're not at the beginning, um, but one of the... We have a paper which will be coming out shortly in Science Advances, uh, which is detailing a, 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 the 20, 25 of the very best results on um, the what have been described as the Bradshaw paintings, now generally called the Guion Guion painting style, very distinctive style across the Kimberley. And they're not they're, they're in the middle of the, a sequence of art styles, and they're um, around about 11 to 16,000, with a big peak of production around 12, 12 and a half thousand, which is quite a significant time when the, the modern world climatically really emerged. <laughs> Well, I still have my samples somewhere in my house, but I've spent most of the last, last month, rather than preparing my talk, I've spent a lot of time searching the house for this. It's there somewhere. It's a bit like those lost files Bill was talking about at the museum. I cannot find it. Um, and most of them, because we already knew that the scientific importance of those little, they're very little pieces, was going to be greatly reduced because you could never get away from the... The, the sort of suggestion of contamination, that most of those ended up as souvenir specimens for all of the rest of us who've been searching that day. But I do still have mine if anyone wants to. I will find it eventually. <laughs> um, to, thank you very much, Andy. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic way to finish the day. Thank you. Thank you.